Hi everybody. What I'm going to do in this video is go over how to use our Shiny application if you're not an R user to help screen your data for low quality data. So this is from a recent publication that was just accepted in Behavior Research Methods where John and I talk about um, especially online data collection. Amazon's Mechanical Turk uh, was a main focus of our project, but it really could be any place where you are not standing there um, monitoring participants. And what we did was we developed a way to um, screen that data for low quality data, which we're defining as low effort um, participants who are just click, click, clicking through and automated response systems like form fillers that are available with the click of a mouse through most browser plugins. And so what we've done is we've created a R function for people to use to screen their data, but we know not everyone uses R. So we've also created a shiny app, which allows you to do this entire screening in browser. I would recommend doing it offline if you can, because the in browser version can be a little slow. Um, but if you can want to do it in browser, you can, if you don't want to do it in the browser and you're familiar with our studio or are willing to download our studio, you could do this offline as well. So the place that you would find the shiny app in browser is linked here on our OSF page. And all of the information that I'm going to talk about today can be found on this OSF page, including the examples that I'm going to go over. So you could open this directly and this will take you to our, um, uh, data screening uh, app and allow you to work on this in browser. I'm going to do this offline so it runs a little faster for this tutorial video, but everything I'm going to do is going to also look like this. So this version is the same version that we're going to open in our studio. So you can do the whole thing through the browser here. Um, the instructions I'm making now, but we can also download the application from GitHub. And so this link will take you directly to what that um, is running. So this here is created by this one little file, app.r. And so if you want to download it, you would click on it um, and then click to download somewhere. It's one of these options. Okay. Or you can copy the whole thing and uh, paste it into RStudio. So what the heck does that look like? Well, if you are familiar, It would look like this. When you are running Shiny, which is a um, package in R, it will automatically realize that that's what's happening and allow you to click Run App. Now there are a couple of things that you would have to do if you wanted to run this one offline. Mostly you would need to install these two packages. And I can recommend some easy tutorials on our own YouTube channel or others YouTube channels. If you want to kind of wade into these waters, maybe you're thinking about learning R and you kind of want to, or you want to do this solely offline, but you don't want to don't tell me the simple path, just let us know in the comments and we will help you get to this point. But if I click run app here, it'll look a whole lot like what you're going to see in the browser. So this is the same thing that's happening um, through Firefox. So the first thing you want to do here is import your data set. This will accept data sets up to three megabytes. If you need something larger than that, you will either need to run it offline or send me an email. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to open an example that we played with when we were first figuring out how to do this. Header here indicates if the first row is the names of the variables. The separator of the data set, so it's either comma, semicolon, or tab. If you're using a CSV file, it's most likely going to be commas. Um, are there quotes of any type? And um, in this particular instance, there are uh, double quotes because this is a very traditional CSV file. So let me find that file. So you click Browse. I'm going to open our example data here. Once the data has been uploaded, you'll get this little upload complete, and you can click on your data to see a rendering of that data. So this is the data table function in R that allows me to look at my data set. And it actually also allows me to do some cool filtering, um, which is very similar to, if you're used to using R Studio, the view window. You can also download your data, but since you just uploaded it, don't know if that's necessary. Now the screener setup is where all the action happens. So we have two sets of information here. You've got required information to make this function run so that the output page shows you something. And then other information that you might be interested in um, also checking. 
So as part of our function, we had five major criteria that we were interested in, and you'll see that in the output here in a minute. Let's start with the easiest thing of the required functions. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to screen my data set for low quality data. This is very specifically for um, Likert style data, where you might have a matrix question if you're using Qualtrics, or you just have a bunch of like one to seven one uh, kinds of answers. This isn't really going to work for typed responses. Um, and then if you're using response latencies, there are other ways to screen the sorts of data. So mainly here, I'm looking at things where I'm asking them to fill out a questionnaire. And so I'm going to put in the name of the first column that that questionnaire appears, and then the name of the last column that that questionnaire appears. And this is why we have where your data can pull up. You can also open the data in Excel. But what happens in R, when you import data with spaces, so if I were to open this file in Excel, this has some spaces, it will translate them with dots. So this will really help you make sure you've got the names of your columns in the same way that they look um, as interpreted by R. Um, and so I'm going to say the first column here is Q11. So I'm going to type that in here. It's Q11. The last column name, so all of these in between are ones that I want, is Q1 underscore 15. And you will want all of these to be lined up next to each other. So they shouldn't have any weird things in the middle. You'll have to rearrange your columns a little bit, maybe in Excel. The min and the max for this was 1 to 7. And I have to have some sort of participant number column. Um, and this just allows you to be able to take the output you're going to get from our function and um, maybe match it up with the um, information that you already have in, about your data set. And now I don't actually have a participant number, so this is a, maybe a bad example, but we're going to use this duration column here because it does not actually mean duration. Um, so I'm just going to make this one my fake participant number. You should have a real participant number in your data set, even if it's just counting up the entire time. As soon as all of that gets entered, the output over here, very slowly sometimes, will um, show you the screened example of what's happening um, based on the columns that you entered. Okay. Now you do have to have a little bit of patience, especially if you have a very large data set. So we screened this on one page of data with a thousand participants, and that takes somewhere between seven and 10 minutes. So um, with fair warning that this can run kind of slow. So what do we have so far? Well, we have our five screeners that we're interested in. Um, and we'll get those numbers as we add more information. We have the number of screening items that the participant was indicated as a bad participant total. And then I got my participant number here. That participant number will help me match this data set, which I can download by clicking one of these down here, um, to my original data set if you wanted to download this information and stick it on the end of your Excel file. So what can I do with this? Well, um, let's go ahead and enter everything, and then we'll talk about each column and what they mean. So under my screener setup here, I'm going to actually enter some more information. Minimally, what happens is the, the columns get checked here for the distribution of the data, which we'll talk about in here in a second. Uh, maximally, you can also check them for page response time, um, click counts, and then a manipulation check. So let's enter page response time here. So the page time column name, we'll click on my data, goes way over here. Okay, so this is the sort of thing that Qualtrics might give me if I use a page timer. So I'm going to use Q2 page submit. I'm not going to use the entire experiment time or the entire survey time because that is a tricky item in Qualtrics because um, let's say a participant gets all the way to the end and then just hit forget to hit submit. The, Time to complete the survey will probably be the time it takes your survey to time out. And so that's not an accurate representation of how long they looked at each page. Well, we're going to re highly recommend you use page timing so you can um, look at how long they viewed each page and how many characters were on each page. And that'll give you a better view of if they're reading each page too quickly. 
Um, our uh, screener does not check for pages that seem too long. We're only trying to catch the people who are going through it so fast that they could not have read the page in that amount of time. So we're only screening for the low end um, because it's difficult to know on the high end if a person just phased out, if they were really reading, or maybe they're watching TV <laughs> while they're taking your study. None of these are very good things, but um, this only checks for the low end. So I'm going to type in Q underscore Q2 page submit. Now it does need to be spelled exactly this way or this won't run. And so I got Q2 underscore page dot submit. Now these two go together. If you're going to do page timing, you also need to enter a number of characters. This is the number of characters or letters in the English language that are on your screen um, when the participant's viewing it. And so in this particular example, we're just going to say it was 200 characters. Um, but what's happening in the background is it's creating a lower response latency. And what that means is it's taking the number of characters and then figuring out how fast someone should have been able to read that page based on English reading um, times. So in our publication, we talk about a um, paper that we found that shows the number of characters that people can read in lots of different languages, not just English, um, and it includes a standard deviation. So it's about 984, if I remember correctly, characters in English per minute, um, plus or minus about 120. So what we did was we uh, added two standard deviations to the 984, it's about 1223, and set that as our upper number of characters per page, per, I'm sorry, per minute. And then that is translated into how long should 200 characters take given that 1223 uh, is uh, a whole minute. So if you have 1400 characters on your page, the minimal number of time that people should spend is over a minute. Uh, 200 characters should be about um, a sixth of a minute. Um, if you had wanted to edit that, this is where you would really have to get into using the actual R code. Um, but we're using those numbers from a publication that showed English reading speeds. We chose to use characters instead of words because words are unpredictable in length, but um, characters are pretty standard. The nice thing about this, if you decide you um, do want to use the R code, is that you can change this yourself, uh, especially if you're maybe working in Spanish uh, or some other language. And so that is hidden in the background and something that um, one of us would be happy to help you with, where the number of char characters can be manipulated here. So I was pretty close, 987, not 984, but I can manipulate those numbers if I instead say want German or um, uh, Japanese or Chinese. The um, article linked in our paper has a bunch of languages. So let me go back here. Now click count. So when you're using Qualtrics, it allows you to do page timing, which is really handy to make sure participants are actually reading the page in the amount of time one would expect. But it also has this really nice feature of click count. Click count is a measure of how many times they clicked on the page with their mouse. If you're using an automated form filler, there are no clicks. And so it records a click count of zero. That is exceedingly handy because now I can get rid of people who pushed one button and had the entire survey filled in automatically for them because we know this happens. Um, it will measure the number of valid responses from a participant and then look at the number of clicks. And as long as they are equal or greater, your participant will be coded as okay. Um, so my, let's say if we have 20 items on a page, there should be at least 20 clicks. And usually there's a little more than that because participants miss a button or they fix a button. Um, so this is the number of clicks before they hit submit. And you want that to be equal to or greater than the number of items that they gave responses to. So this will handle if a participant misses a response because it's easy to do on these sorts of surveys. Okay. In Qualtrics, that usually comes up with a uh, click count name. So we're gonna do that over here. The last feature that you can add to your, that's like quick and easy to help eliminate low quality data is a manipulation check. And this is simply a column that says, please answer strongly agree. 
or please mark strongly disagree or just some sort of question that you have to read to know what the answer is. And so in my particular data set, we made that question 15, so Q1 15, and the answer was seven. So I'm gonna type that in here. And then I have to also put in the correct answer, seven. Okay. So if you're gonna do page timing, make sure you enter characters, click count as separate, a manipulation check goes together. Okay. All of these are optional, so if you leave them blank, it will still run. Um, so you could not, if you don't have some of this information, that would be okay. All right, we're gonna click on output here and we're gonna kind of wait for a second so that all of our numbers will come up or it'll give me an error message because I typed something wrong. So if you see an error message that says something about a column not found, that's because you've misspelled your column name. Also, um, when things are important into R with spaces, it will change them to dots. And sometimes um, just make sure that you have it spelled exactly the same way as it shows up in the your data area. All right, so what do all these things mean? So this bad char here is for bad um, characters. So this is sort of bad reading. Uh, these are people who read this, uh, the page faster than they should have given the amount of characters on the screen. So we've got five responses here where they read it too fast. Um, don't forget this only shows you 10 items per page so there will be more people um, based on the pages but you can download the entire um, output here to an Excel document to if you want to view all of it at once. Okay. So there are people who are reading too fast. A zero means that they're okay. A one means that they are flagged or bad in this sense. So that's what the bad indicates here. It means anytime you see a one, they're indicated as a participant that you maybe should think about excluding in your study. Bad click here is people who have less click counts than the number of items answered. And this is really nice because our um, first five rows here are fake data. And so those all people got, all of those people got marked. If I flip over here and look at my data and scroll over and look at our page submit times and our click count. So our page submit times here, that's four seconds in Qualtrics. So four seconds was not enough time to read everything on the page, but these are real responses where they're more than four seconds. So these people are real participants. Click count here is people, uh, this is just, they, there were no clicks because this is fake data. And so that's why these people got marked. Here there are enough clicks for the number of items. Back to the output here. Bad distribution. So bad distribution is a measure of the distribution of the data. So what we did was we uh, calculated the likelihood, uh, in a sense, of uh, the distribution of a participant's answers being either normal um, or skewed normal uh, and or, or <laughs> Uh, uniform. So when we were testing uh, this idea of low quality, uh, low effort, and automated data, we found that when people are not really trying, they tend to use a lot of the scale. So on a one to seven scale, they tend to use the entire scale. But when people try, they tend to skew towards the top, the middle, or the bottom. And so what we find is that the distribution of the data for participants who are trying is at least somewhat normal. The distribution of the data for, for fake data and participants who aren't trying is more uniform, it's flat. So you have an even number of um, answers in each response category. This is not the best screener. Uh, in our uh, paper, it only identifies like a quarter of the bad responses, but um, it still was useful in tandem with other response, uh, other screeners. And this is the one that causes it to run a little slow. Um, so the distribution check measures if it's more like a normal distribution or more like a uniform distribution. If it's more uniform, you'll get that they're a bad participant. If it's more normal, you'll get that they're a good participant. Okay. And so um, what happens, how it does that is a chi-square analysis where it's compared against what one would expect given a uniform distribution or what one would expect given a normal distribution. And um, the lower chi-square wins, which is very similar to like a structural equation model. Okay. Uh, under bad scale check here, this was the other half of trying to 
find the best way to screen when the distribution is uniform. And so what we saw again was that fake data um, really evenly picked each category of responses. So if you had a one to seven, there were equal numbers of them in each category. And that is really unusual for real participants. People tend to pick four, five, six, four, five, four, five, one, seven, one, seven. So they don't tend to pick all of the options. Now this gets really problematic with smaller numbers of response options. So if you only have a one to four, the odds of them picking all four of them is a little higher and this is not the best. Um, this could be potentially uh, oversensitive to participants picking items. If you have a one to seven, it's it seems to work out pretty well. Um, so what it does here is it marks the participant as a bad participant if they use more than half of the scale. So it takes the number of, of options by looking at your min and your max. So we have seven options in this example, divides that in half, so three and a half, and then adds one. So a participant here would be marked if they used five or more options because four and a half rounded up, <laughs> it's five options. So this will um, mark participants who use more than half of the scale. On a four item scale, that's three of the items. So if they picked one, two, three the entire time, then they would be marked. And so we don't really suggest you use any one of these individually, but rather you use all of these together as a way to screen for particip bad participants. Okay. So this picks, looks at the number of uh, options that they used and marks them if they use more than half. Bad manipulation check here is if they got the manipulation check question right or wrong. So if they got it right, they get a zero. If they got it wrong, they get a one. So in all of these, I've got the word bad in front for you to realize that one means that they did not pass the screener. Okay. Total hopefully is obvious. So this is the total number of indicators that uh, were marked for this participant. And we can sort this data and see that our fake data was marked on four of them. So usually it's marked on the distribution check as well. Um, and I can decide what to do now. So our suggestion from our paper was if you had all of this type of information, so you had click counts and response page times and a man uh, manipulation check question, was that if a participant got two I, uh, markers, you should ditch them. Uh, and I would really encourage you to read the paper on why too. You can change that though. So this is a recommendation, not a, um, not a critical line in the sand or anything you wanna think about p-values. Um, so we don't really recommend two as like a one size fits all approach, but two seem to work best given our, our study. Uh, and that was mostly because uh, at two indicators, you were eliminating 98% of the bad data that we knew was bad because of the way we ran our study. And you were only gonna lose a little bit of data that was actually high effort. So it really allowed you to cut the crap um, while also balancing the loss of um, good quality data. So we said if you have at least two indicators, you should go. You could change that. You could say at least three indicators. You could say, no, they need to hit um, four. Five, hitting all five is pretty rare. So um, four might be your kind of upper limit here. Um, but we'd, I would make a plug here for pre-registering your choices so that you have, you know, justifying your choices here uh, on why, which ones you're gonna use and which um, options you're going to plan for in the future and that will really allow you to uh, make sure that these don't seem like just ways to uh, p-hack or to make a questionable research practice. So you could use our study as an example of I'm going to pre-register this and say we're going to include all of these things in our Qualtrics study so that we can screen the data in the way that was suggested or no we're going to use three as our cutoff. Um, so this is how you use our app though. And like I said, if you wanted to match this to your participants to check uh, maybe a sensitivity analysis, running it with and without bad participants, feel free to always click on the button to download, which um, doesn't always happen nicely in studio. It runs a little slow, but in browser that works pretty well. So thanks for listening, and that is how you use our app. And please let us know in YouTube or sending an email to buchananlab at gmail. So B-U-C-H-A-N-A-N-L-A-B 
at gmail.com if you have questions about how to make this happen.